Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the ICT, the International Institute for Counterterrorism's premier podcast, Counterterrorism Today. I'm Itai Hanman, your host, and we have a very special program for you today. Uh, on the program, we are going to be speaking about a new book that has just come out this past November called Homegrown, ISIS in America. It's written by the Deputy Director for the Program on Extremism at George Washington University, Seamus Hughes. He is an expert on terrorism, homegrown violent extremism, and countering violent extremism. We are going to speak to him about his latest book as well as those topics. Uh, Seamus Hughes, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. It's nice and snowy in DC, so I'm glad to be able to do this. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to join our program and discuss a little bit about homegrown violence, extremism, and specifically your book. Um, but before we get into this latest book of yours, uh, maybe you can give us a little bit of a background on how you sort of came to the topic of extremism, violence, terrorism. Uh, what drew you to this field and to be working as an academic in it? Yeah, I just kind of fell into it. So I started my career working campaigns, um, political campaigns, and I worked for a, a senator from Connecticut named Joe Lieberman. And he had he was the chairman of the Senate and Homeland Security Committee. So about 15, um, 16 years ago, I started as an intern on the committee. Uh, and the, the gentleman who had the portfolio of homegrown terrorism moved on to another job. And at the time, you know, you were talking about three or four cases a, a, a year, right? It was a relatively small phenomenon. The average age was a was 22 or something like that, and so they they gave me the portfolio and said you can't ruin it, right? <laughs> Just go ahead and try it. Um, and unfortunately um, for for the country, the the numbers kept going up. So I did an investigation to the Fort Hood attacks uh, in 2009. Um, I did oversight of the National Counterterrorism Center and the intelligence community. Spent about five years in the Senate on working on the 9/11 Commission Recommendation Act and things like that. And then um, someone at the National Counterterrorism Center said, you know, you think you're so smart, why don't you come work for us? And so I um, spent about five years there working, um, mostly community engagement on these issues. So when a bomb goes off or something bad happens, you know, the imam of the mosque in Boston will call me and say, you know, two of my guys just did a horrible thing. Can you help me prevent the next two guys from doing that? And so I spent about five years on the road talking mostly to Muslim American communities about how to prevent um, groups like Al-Qaeda and now ISIS um, from recruiting um, Americans. And so did that for a while. And then when the program on extremism at, at George Washington University launched uh, six years ago, um, my colleague Lorenzo Vedino said, you know, do you want to come help me build this, this place up? And so I've been there since we started. That's excellent. And what a, what a very interesting path to get to uh, the Center for Violent Extremism. And I wanted to just quickly touch on something that you made mention there uh, prior to coming over uh, was going around, as you were saying, speaking to the American Muslim community about prevention. Um, is that along the lines of see something, tell something? Uh, is that where that program or sort of along those lines? Yeah, some, something like that. I mean, these are very difficult conversations, right? Because you you don't want to walk into a room and, and, and try to imply that, that everyone you're talking to is a, is a threat, um, and most certainly not, right? Um, it's a little bit of explaining government policy, you know, what's drone policy, what's, uh, what are your rights as a U.S. citizen, and then what role is government um, should play when it comes to individuals who are drawn to groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, and what role are community partners on that. And so because of, you know, the First Amendment and um, Establishment Clause issues, you know, there are bright lines between government and the public on these issues. So what are the areas, areas we can work together, right? Where If I've got a... a a young man who's thinking about joining a group like Al Qaeda, uh, or is talking about how great Anwar Alaki's video is, there is a role for the for the bureau and the FBI, right? Um, but there is also a role for that circle around him um, to try to get him back into the fold before he crosses a legal threshold, right? Before he commits a, a violent act, and so that's where we were, right? The space before an arrest, space before boom, um, and those again, very difficult, but I think important conversations, right? You're trying your best to save people from themselves. And that's very interesting. And as you made mention, it is a very difficult conversation to have with a community that may feel under threat, not just by government, by its fellow citizens, um, as well as internationally. Um, it's a, a tight knit community. So it must be difficult conversations to have and commend you for having those because they are very difficult. 
Um, but they do, even if they can save one life, are an extremely important conversation to have. Um, before we delve into your book, you did mention two things that I had written down to ask you about. So I figure let's get right into that. Uh, you mentioned the Fort Hood uh, attack in 2009, Major Nadal Hassan, um, and you mentioned Anwar al waki two people I had written down to speak to you a little bit about. When you speak about homegrown terrorism, uh, is al waki a prime example of that? Yeah, I mean, he's example number one. Um, here's a, an imam who um, spent his formative years here um, from New Mexico, spent some time in California, and then um, hit most of his time in Virginia um, running a, a mosque there. And here's a guy who was kind of well-known throughout the American Muslim community, um, very accessible in the way he did lectures, and then slowly started um, veering towards the kind of Al-Qaeda uh, or Islamist mindset, right? And so you had an, a number of lectures that were just like handed out to people, um, just like you would for uh, any other prominent kind of religious leader, right? Once he decides to cross that threshold and, and goes into Yemen and joins Al-Qaeda Al in the Arabian Peninsula, you know, you have somebody who already has a baseline level of support and they don't, not a whole lot of people realized he made that jump, right? And so trying to kind of demystify Anwar al um, who was very kind of as compelling as, as one could get in terms of an influencer, uh, we, you know, we think of him as like a virtual spiritual sanctuary, right? These are folks that, you know, somebody like Nadal Hassan, which I'll talk to you about in a minute, you know, Nadal Hassan reaches out to Al-Waki and says, you know, I'm thinking about doing something and would that be permissible? And Alaki says, yeah, no problem, right? Um, gives him the blessing. Um, and so that's, that, that was very important at that time. And you're talking about an English speaking um, religious leader who was able to tap into uh, a network of folks that he had built for the last two dozen years. In fact, he was kind of the, the superstar of, of jihadism at the time, right? Um, every case that you looked at, somebody had downloaded an Anwar Alaki video before they decided to commit an attack. And then, you know, that transitions pretty well to Nadal Hassan, right? A major in, in um, the US military, uh, a doctor, a lot of warning signs um, throughout his service, right? The lectures he was giving, the talks he was talking to people about, you know, there was a lot of things that are blinking red, um, but nobody put the pieces together. You had, you know, Department of Defense working, working the case, and then you had the FBI working the case, but neither one of them were talking. And as a result, um, everybody missed this, the signs and he was able to commit a, a horrific act at Fort Hood at the processing center as people were coming in um, about to be deployed out. Um, that was one of the, um, the, the most prime examples of homegrown violent extremism or homegrown terrorism in the last 10 years, and one of the most deadly attacks since 9-11. Uh, and so when we talk about homegrown terrorism, we truly mean homegrown terrorism, right? Nadal Hassan was, was born and raised here spent his formative years, you know, 20 miles away from where I was, right? Um, and here's a guy who, who knew the American system and, and decided to reject it. Very interesting. And uh, to anyone that is not yet familiar with al Waki's story, the most uh, prominent, I guess, U.S. citizen uh, taken out by a drone strike by the U sanctioned by the U.S. Uh, president and government and the administration has that specific event affected the way the United States government uh, examines uh, homegrown terrorists and the way to, uh, to look at them? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's two ways um, I think it changed it, right? One is there was a determination within government that Anwar al reached a level where um, he could be killed by a drone strike or, or an airstrike, right? Which was a high threshold. It still is a high threshold for Americans, right? Uh, and so that determination was uh, not only the inspiration, which I think, um, you know, if it was just inspiration, that's one thing, but he was also an operational planner. You know, he had a, he had a role in um, planning some of the um, bombs that were placed in uh, airplanes around the country, around the world, right? And so once he crossed that line, um, that's when he became something that, that you could, um, you know, commit military action against. Um, but it was, I mean, to be fair, it's, it's still controversial, right? Uh, you know, it, it, I think the American people can see one thing of a drone strike um, overseas for foreigners. It's another thing to see a drone strike of a, a guy from New Mexico, right? And you've seen a number of Americans, especially with ISIS, who have um, risen through the ranks to the point where um, they're now on the radar of uh, military and law enforcement officers in a way they hadn't before, say, 10, 15 years ago. 
So when you say uh, rising to a very high threshold, which makes perfect sense, um, and then separating inspirational leadership, if you will, and technical uh, actual implementation and working uh, strategically, would that be the difference between Nadal Hassan uh, and the Fort Hood attack and potentially the underwear bomber, Umar Farouk Abdul Matalab? who uh, was trying to blow up that flight over Detroit, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and again, from my understanding, Awaki had a lot more planning or operational involvement in that attack. Is that sort of the threshold that you uh, need yeah. to look at? Yeah, that's exactly right. So look at Nadal Hassan, right? He commits that attack, but prior to that, he, spends, he sends 14 emails to Anwar Awaki um, of varying different degrees. And Alaki only responds to two. And what he does, it's a one-liner or two sentences, right? And so there's a level of inspiration. Clearly, Nadal was, was inspired by what Anwar Alaki said, right? Um, but when you look at, at um, the, the underwear bomber, you know, that's an individual who left uh, the UK, um, ended up eventually in Yemen, and uh, was then basically handed um, the keys to the kingdom of how to build a bomb, uh, training, and then sent off, right? And so that's a level of one-on-one -on -one interaction, I think, that um, separates him from the dozens of other cases in America of Americans that are you know, merely inspired by Alaki. Very interesting. And uh, you did bring up uh, the Boston bombings as well. Those are two brothers that committed those attacks. Um, uh, and would you consider them homegrown, seeing as they are immigrants to the United States to begin with, uh, but did spend you know, quite a bit of their life in the United States prior to the attack. Yeah, well, I would consider them homegrown terrorists. Uh, you know, th the threshold for us is formative years, right? Did they, did they spend a majority of their time here? Um, you know, that, that threshold changes if someone hit, was here for a year studying and then goes back home or something like that. But you know, those two brothers um, you know, lived in Boston, had friends in Boston, family in Boston, knew the American system very well, were through and through Americans. Um, and so, yeah, that's absolutely homegrown terrorism. And we have this debate sometimes in academia, which I think is one of those things where it's a, a difference without a distinction, right? Uh, you'll see cases of an individual who is a refugee, um, but he came when he was two and committed an attack when he was 22, right? right. Um, that's homegrown terrorism, right? Even though he is identified as a refugee in the data set, you know, he was, he was uh, inspired by his actions here, right? That's not a a sleeper cell, it's a coma cell, right? It barely wakes up. Um, and so you do see that happen quite a bit. Sometimes, I mean, occasionally you have folks that, that abuse the system, right? A great example of that would be a guy named Abdullah Pizarra from uh, Missouri. So Pizarra is this like a uh, guy straight out of central casting of, a, of an ISIS recruit. He's uh, running a battalion of foreign fighters in Raqqa. Uh, he's riding a motorcycle. He's got the, the bullets around him and he's just, exactly what you expect in terms of an ISIS guy, right? He spent a good amount of time in the US. He was a truck driver, had a failed marriage, a bunch of friends. But the reason why he got his US citizenship was so that he could travel. In fact, he gets his US citizenship and then 16 days later gets on a plane and, and goes and joins the Islamic State. So there are some examples of folks kind of abusing the system because it's a little bit easier, right? To be fair, um, to join a terrorist organization because you're not on the radar as an American. Very interesting. And uh, since 9-11, there have been so many different potential attacks and attacks, uh, thwarted attacks. Uh, I have to give a lot of credit to uh, the FBI and the national security intelligence apparatuses that are involved with preventing a lot of these potential attacks. Um, so how did you come to the idea of writing a book, Homegrown Terrorism, ISIS in America, uh, where does that come from? What inspires you to write that? And clearly, there is enough to write an entire book about. So um, I'm assuming in your research, you have found quite a bit more than what you may have expected. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when we started to, to think about this book, it was about three years ago. And we had um, a number of ISIS cases that were coming through. In fact, it, when you look at the ISIS cases in America, it's relatively unprecedented. Um, still a relatively small number, but unprecedented for the U.S. context. And we kept getting, we have about 20,000 pages of legal documents. And I had interviewed a number of men and women who had joined terrorist organizations in Syria and come back, um, a number of men and women who were in jail for terrorism crimes. 
And I just thought there was a good story to be told there and a way to do it in kind of a dispassionate, um, academic but accessible uh, way. And so I think the book would have been much different if we wrote it you know, at the height of ISIS. Um, but with a little bit of perspective, a little bit of time, you can really put it in context of what you're looking at, right? Uh, again, a relatively large phenomenon for the US, um, a little uh, unprecedented phenomenon, um, but a lot of different disparate pieces, right? From the, um, the truck driver in Missouri we just talked about to um, the religious leader in Virginia to the 70 year old who runs a pizza parlor in New York and he's coordinating a bunch of jihadist groups in Syria uh, on his phone while he's flipping pizzas, right? There is a, a spectrum of stories um, out there. And we try to our best, me and my, my co-authors, Alex Hitchens and Bennett Clifford, to put it all together in a way that was accessible. What would you say was the most surprising thing or something that really stood out to you when you were writing this book that you didn't necessarily think about or uh, know about beforehand or something that even you did know or think about that just further research and writing about it really now stood out to you as, wow, that's a major influence or that was a major event that wasn't given enough attention or something to, along those lines. Yeah, I think I was surprised. Um, well, I was a little surprised at the fact that, that how many cases we're dealing with, right? And by that, I mean, and how, many, how connected they were. And so you would see these like a local stories of like, you know, an arrest in Ohio, an arrest in Indiana, and the local reporters would write it and not realize that those two guys actually knew each other in the same telegram channel or had connected with each other through uh, a religious leader in Dearborn, right? And so seeing those connections in a way that I think, again, a little perspective is allowed to can put it in a larger context. And that was always our goal, right? Put it in a larger context. Don't just tell these one or two stories, but tell the network and, and the story of what it means when we say homegrown um, terrorism in America, right? Because sometimes it's a loaded term. Sometimes you think, you know, uh, you don't want to be too alarmist. There, there's not people hiding in your bed trying to kill you. On the other hand, there's not um, nothing, right? And so there is something in between and, and it's incumbent on us as, as academics to do our best um, to, to put that out there for the public to understand with, again, not being alarmist, but tells a good story. Very interesting. And um, when you are putting together these stories and looking at it, when you think about, uh, I think for the layman, definitely, when they hear the words homegrown ISIS uh, terrorist, um, not necessarily going to the boogeyman, you know, man in my bed waiting to kill me type of thing. Um, but I think a lot of people have an image in their head of, sort of a maybe a lone wolf terrorist, a distraught young man uh, that has lost everything or is connected with something overseas and is willing to go now commit acts of violence on their own. Um, but you did mention that something that you were looking at sees connections between uh, some of these people. So in your opinion, how much of these homegrown extremists are networked and how many of them are really isolated lone wolf terrorists like a lot of it is described in the media? Yeah, I, th I think most of them are networked, um, but a small network, right? Um, in the U.S., the story of, of homegrown ISIS recruitment is stories of, of twos and threes and not fives and sixes. And so you do see family members traveling over to Syria and Iraq. You saw um, plots that involved, you know, high school friends who would all come together. And so you're more likely to join a terrorist organization if your best friend joins a terrorist organization, right? You're more likely to, to get on that plane if the guy next to you, you've known for 10 years and believes what you're doing is right. And I think that is one of the, the huge takeaways on, on this, this is, you know, we spend a lot of time on the online environment, right? There's, a, of course, a role for online recruitment and radicalization in places like Facebook or, or, or Telegram, right? But um, these guys are online, but they're online because the average age is, is 28. And so if they're not online, um, they're, they're Luddites, right? You just, you don't see it. Um, they tend to use those in-person connections. And a great example of that would be say a place like uh, Minneapolis, which um, has a relatively large small American population. Um, you know, Lewis to Maine has the same um, breakdown in population demographics, but it had zero cases. And the reason why is because Minneapolis, it was the brothers, sisters, and roommates of guys who joined Al-Shabaab in Somalia five years before that, right? So you had an in-person network, similar to what you would see in Europe. Um, but for the most part in the U.S., you're not talking about that. Uh, you're talking about ones and twos, twos and threes, right? And a lot of that has to do with the fact that, that law enforcement in the U.S. is um, aggressive uh, in the way they attract, um, uh, approach this, right? 
we've got something called the material support to terrorism clause, which is relatively unprecedented in, in the Western world, which allows for the FBI to interject themselves earlier in the process than they would before. You know, if you drive to O'Hare airport and you're planning on getting on a plane, that overt act of driving the airport is material support, the material being yourself, right? And so you can arrest an individual and put them away for 20 years for that overt act. Um, but you didn't see that say in the UK where it wasn't illegal to travel and to, to ISIS control territory until recently. Very interesting. Are there many other examples or differences that you find between the way the United States handles these homegrown uh, travelers to ISIS and whatnot versus how the Europeans handle it? Yeah, we're, we're, we're a bit behind, behind the curve when we talk about um, prevention issues, right? So what we talked about before is my main job in five years was, was doing community engagement in, in the U.S. on these issues, trying to prevent folks from crossing the threshold. Um, we don't necessarily put a lot of resources into that. And I think a lot of that is, is twofold. One is the numbers are relatively small, right? You know, in, in, in Europe, you're talking about 5,000 folks who travel to Syria and Iraq. In the U.S., you're talking a couple hundred, right? And so you can, with a, with a pretty significant law enforcement apparatus, which we have, um, arrest your way out of most of this problem, um, for lack of a better word. And so that doesn't force you to be creative, right? Um, you don't have to think about dis, uh, diversion, disengagement, de-radicalization programs, if you're talking about a sm relatively small subset. So I think that's the difference between us and, and, and in other places. The other thing is, again, is uh, we don't have these large scale networks, right? Um, you're not talking about Sharia 4 UK handing out leaflets in Birmingham. Um, we just didn't have that same dynamic happening at Times Square. And when you were researching your book, um, I'm sure you were looking into different methods of radicalization, how these uh, people were radicalized before joining ISIS or willing to commit a crime or commit a violent act. Um, and I wanted to ask you, did you find any correlation between prison sentences and radicalization? No, I mean, in the US, for the most part, prison, this idea of prison radicalization has been the dog that hasn't bit. And so, of course, you see people that go into prison and, and, and hold extreme beliefs. But for the most part, that's a, a phase when they're in prison and when they get out. Um, they usually kind of veer back. Um, we have systems in place to um, separate uh, would-be jihadists from general population so they can't recruit. Uh, what I think is, is probably the more interesting part is what do we do with these folks when they get out? And the answer is we don't really have a very good system at all. And right, so if terrorism is a form of crime, of, of course it is, right? And a, a vicious crime, but a form of crime. And crime has recidivism built into it just by its very nature. You're going to see a number of people kind of spend their time in prisons and then move on and get those connections, right? We had a case like uh, John Georgilis in Texas, who is, was a very high ranking member in ISIS and ran their English language magazine, right? And so occasionally you do see that, um, you know, prior to that, he spent some time in prison for um, hacking the, the APAC website. And so um, you do see that, but for the most part, no. Um, the other thing I would notice is, and the difference in the US context is, um, there is not necessarily a, a crime terrorism nexus uh, as you would expect. So in say France, um, you do see these overlays of, of you know, people that were petty criminals go into prison and come out hardened jihadists. Um, in the U.S., it tends to be their first crime is a crime of terrorism or, or the attempt of a crime of terrorism. Very interesting. And I wonder why that is. And that's something I uh, have to look into further to try to the understand. Next book. I'll do that in the next book. Yeah. There we go. In the next book. Um, so uh, maybe you can just tell us a little bit more about uh, a specific story that stood out to you when writing uh, Homegrown. Yeah, I mean, one of the stories we, we had um, access to a lot of FBI agents. I was fortunate that the, the FBI was willing to let us um, talk to a number of the case agents. Um, one of the cases that stood out to me was a guy in, um, in Virginia named Muhammad Jala. And Jala was a um, National Guardsman um, who was drawn to ISIS and wanted to travel and go join uh, the Islamic State. And so he took basically a detour and he went to Nigeria and his plan was to then make his way to Libya and then eventually join the, the ISIS affiliate there. He gets over there, gets on a bus and the bus of course um, breaks down and the, and the tire um, goes flat and he has a change of heart, right? Or at least a temporary change of heart. He comes back to the US and he reaches out to a guy named Sudani 
And so Sudani is this guy online um, who was part of a, what we call the Legion of Doom, or what, so what the, the Bureau called the Legion of Doom. These were six or seven individuals in Raqqa at the same computer lab, changing out phones and SIM cards and systematically reaching out to Americans to encourage attacks, right? It's a virtual planning, right? Uh, a level of virtual plotting that we hadn't seen before. Similar to like, uh, you know, think of Adam Gadan in the old days of the, the third in command in Al Qaeda, uh, who would talk about how everyone should join uh, Al Qaeda. The problem is Adam, Adam Gadan's not very enticing, right? He's not very not a very good speaker. He'd talk, he'd drone on for 40 minutes uh, on a talk, and no one would take him up on his offer of committing a terrorist attack. These guys were using kind of a one-on-one -on -one whisper campaign. Um, here's the knife you need to use. Here's the here's the gun. Here's the base, right? And in Jala's case, he reached out to, to Sudani and Sudani said, um, absolutely, you can join us. You know, you may want to think about doing an attack in the U.S. first. Um, and so send me a little bit of money and we'll go from there. Here's the most interesting part about it. Sudani didn't realize uh, he wanted to hand Jala off to another operative. You know, Sudani was too busy with all the other guys he was trying to recruit. And so he handed out, off our National Guardsman, Jala, to another operative online. That other operative was actually an FBI undercover agent. And Sudani didn't realize it. And so that FBI undercover agent held Jala's hand the entire time until he got to the point where Jala on, the, on July 3rd was um, Googling uh, where the, the latest veterans parade was and had just bought a gun, right? And that's when the FBI jumps, jumps into action. You, you know, I talked to a couple FBI agents who said, we, we lost our weekend that, that weekend. I didn't see my friends and family for a few weeks and we worked that case hard. Uh, and so they ended up taking um, down Jala, arresting him and sentencing him to, I think he got about 15 to 20 years. Um, but from the outward perspective, you've got a National Guardsman, you've got a guy who's, who's going through the system. You know, he shouldn't be the, what we would think as of a typical profile of an ISIS recruit. Um, but I think that's another one of the takeaways from the book is there's not a typical profile of an ISIS recruit in America, right? They're old, they're young, they're rich, they're poor, they're black, they're white, they're converts, then they're reverts to the faith. Right. Uh, there's not really a rhyme or reason. They all share the same um, belief system and, and, and ideology, right? a jihadist or Islamist ideology, uh, but they come at it at a different way. Do you or have you been able to figure out what specifically, um, I guess, connects them all in their attraction to ISIS? specifically coming from the Western world, specifically coming from the United States, growing up in the United States, uh, the luxuries and comforts of the United States, not even talking about personal socioeconomic backgrounds, but just the lifestyle that's afforded to someone living in the United States, potentially. Um, and they come from similar backgrounds in that sense. Um, what do you think attracts them to want to fly across the world to a war zone to join a known terrorist organization that's an enemy of the country that, you know, that they live in, their family, their livelihood? Right. I think that that's one of the reasons why I, I started doing this type of research is, you know, a lot of these folks have the same background as I did, right? Um, you know, went to high schools near me uh, and it didn't really make much sense to me. Uh, I would say, you know, one of the biggest drivers for the American ISIS scene was the announcement of a caliphate or the so-called caliphate, right? This idea of building a utopian society as, as, as wrong as that, that utopian society would be from any rational thinker, right? Was a driver for them. And it's a reason why if you look at the data set of the 200 plus people who have been arrested or charged, the vast, vast majority have been charged with trying to travel to Syria and Iraq. And I've interviewed a lot of those individuals who came back. And some of them, you know, we're really drawn, I mean, you, you have a subset of people who just wanna watch the world burn, right? You can't ignore that and, and are drawn to the violence, but some of them are, are drawn to the, for lack of a better word, more positive narrative, right? A great case of that would be a guy named Warren Clark from Texas, right? Warren Clark is a 6'1 African-American convert with a lazy eye and was really drawn to this idea of a caliphate. So much so um, that, you know, I had a, a colleague whose house got taken over in Mosul by ISIS. It's a nice house, right? And so all the foreign fighters lived at that house. And when the Iraqi special forces took back Mosul, there was a bunch of documents still there. Included in those documents was a resume and a cover letter from Warren Clark. Uh, Clark from Texas had sent a letter and a resume to ISIS and said, you know, this is an exact quote, um, dear Islamic State, uh, my name is Warren Clark. I have taught English to, um, to students in Fort Bend, Texas, 
and I believe that my skill set would be very good for the University of Mosul, right? It's a very American way of joining a terrorist organization, if you, if you could ever think of it, right? Um, and you think to yourself, what the hell? I mean, that can't be real, um, but it absolutely was. And Clark had been able to, um, to separate his, um, the, the beheading videos that we all saw in the nightly news with this idea, idea of like candy out to kids in Raqqa and electricity in Mosul and building this utopian society. And so that was a big driver for them, right? Um, to get away from this, this materialistic society into one that is, is um, you know, Islamically sound or what they saw as Islamically sound, right? Uh, and so we can't discount that uh, role. In fact, I think that's one of the reasons why this year we've seen a number of cases, um, you know, seriously drop or, or plateau. It's because there's not that bug light anymore that will attract the Americans to go join like the so-called caliphate did. Very interesting. As uh, has been noted, that's a very big difference between Al-Qaeda and ISIS specifically. Al-Qaeda, the, the establishment of the caliphate, is the last step in the jihad. Uh, we saw ISIS establish the caliphate and then sort of move on from there as a first step. Um, and would you then say that that's a difference in why ISIS had a better, uh, better did a better job of attracting Americans to come over and join ISIS versus Al Qaeda, or does it have to do with the time frame being uh, the age group that are being attracted, millennials versus uh, an older generation that saw Al Qaeda, you know, born in the late '80s and foreign fighters in the to Afghanistan to fight the Soviets. Um, does it have to do with the digital revolution and the use of the digital uh, space that Al Qaeda didn't, or what would you say is the difference there? I think the, the difference is um, ISIS had both a message and a messenger. And so the message was a caliphate, right? This was something that drove them, but also a platform or a, or a messenger in terms of um, social media, right? So um, the, the ease and accessibility to be able to reach a recruiter in, in Syria was not particularly hard, right? And so it lowered the bar for um, recruitment. It's a democratization of radicalization in many ways, right? And so you're able to talk to those rock stars in, in Syria that you have been following for a while and, and, and talk to them in real time, right? Again, a level of accessibility. Um, it's also bite-sized messaging, right? We're talking about 280 characters, as opposed to Al-Qaeda, which traditionally is, has like those 80 page tomes that we'd all have to read and, um, and drone through. And these are more of, um, you know, the, less of a thinking man's terrorist group for lack of a better word, right? And so it allows for um, a mass movement in a way you hadn't seen before. Um, when completing your book now, I wanted to ask you if you have sort of an exact number or at least a ballpark of how many Americans actually went over to join ISIS. Yeah, so uh, this is the, the white whale for me. I've been trying to chase this one for a while. Uh, the FBI says 300 people had traveled or attempted to travel to Syria and Iraq. And one of the main reasons I wrote the book is because that, that number pisses me off, right? Um, because I don't know if it means 280 attempted to and 20 got there or vice versa. And so when we did the book, we decided we want to figure out that number. Um, and what we found was identified at least 100 Americans who we know by true legal name traveled to Syria and Iraq to join jihadist groups, right? That is the floor, it's not the ceiling. I think we're probably talking something north of 100 to 250 uh, Americans at its height. Um, we're talking about 18 year olds and older, um, family members are much younger, and we had a number of family members who, who traveled over there. Um, so again, small numbers for any other um, country, and I think you know, places like the UK or Britain or Germany would, would um, love to have the type of numbers we had, uh, but still unprecedented for the US context. So in your opinion then, how big of a threat do these ISIS uh, recruits have, that have come back or didn't pose a threat to the United States? What type of a threat? Yeah, there's, there's two type of things I would be worried about, right? Um, the first is most of the people that came back um, came back disillusioned and disenchanted with their time in ISIS. And they tended to flip and, and give states evidence and, and talk to the FBI about their time. That's the earlier cases. Um, the later cases are the true believers through and through. Right? These are individuals who, who were through all of ISIS for a number of years, have gotten out and are trying to come back. And I think that's the one that we're more concerned. The other thing to look, about, look at for threat is um, folks that are angry that they missed their window, right? They had this great caliphate and the um, coalition of 100 plus countries took it away from us. 
and it's incumbent on us to either um, avenge that that loss or try to build it back again. And so the mobilization pool, so like folks that are drawn to groups like ISIS, has clearly shrunk, um, and that has to do with you know takedowns of social media and arrests, right? But the so the recruitment pool is shrunk, but the mobilization pool is deeper, right? The folks that are left are, are again true believers through and through, and so that would be where my concern would be um, if I'm law enforcement, particularly as these guys move away from overt messaging and overt platforms into more um, platforms that allow for a level of encryption, and that's a bit harder in terms of resources for the law enforcement to interject themselves into. Very interesting. This whole entire conversation has been sobering and enlightening and uh, very, very interesting. Uh, before we let you go, if you could at least uh, let our audience know, A, where they could get your book, uh, as well as some of the other great stuff that you write about, some of the reports that you produce for the center, um, and where people will be able to follow you on social media. Sure. So our, our book is um, available anywhere you would normally buy a book, so Amazon and, and local bookstores too. And so I would encourage you to do so. I, I'd appreciate the support. Um, I am at the program of extremism. Our website is extremism.gwu.edu. Um, they are part of a team of folks who look at extremism in America, and that can run the spectrum between ISIS and Al Qaeda to our latest project now, which is tracking everyone who've been arrested for uh, the Capitol Hill siege on January 6th, right? And so domestic terrorism and domestic extremism. Uh, Do, my sorry Twitter to cut you off. Yep. Does your center classify that as violent riots or terrorism? Uh, yeah, so it depends on the on the case. Uh, you know, if you look at like the uh, the militia guys, the Oath Keepers and Three Percenters, that's a level of operational planning and training uh, and, a, and a point to, to try to effect uh, political change, right? The idea was to arrest um, Vice President Pence uh, and put him on trial, right? Clearly terrorism. There are some set, subset of people in that 180 right now who've been in charge or arrested who were taking selfies uh, in the Capitol Rotunda, right? That's a different dynamic. Still wanted to affect political change, um, but not kind of the hardened what we would view as 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 extremism. I think it's probably best to look at it as a sedition or insurrection type of charges um, with some mixture of terrorism. And we'll see this great debate. And we'll, the problem and the issue and the the, the next thing we're going to see in in terrorism or extremism studies is that debate, right? When that that line blurs a lot, right? The first the great example would be like incels, like involuntary celibates, right? Um, not really a political ideology, but still has a lot of terrorism kind of tactics. And there's been a number of my colleagues, um, including Professor Bruce Hoffman, who's argued, you know, this is terrorism. Um, but we're seeing this line um, not be as clear cut as, as it used to be. You know, I have the easy job right now looking at ISIS and Al Qaeda cases, right? Those I can identify, I can look at. But if I'm looking at domestic extremism, you know, we will see somebody float from QAnon to uh, militias to white supremacy to incels and it just doesn't fit in the buckets you would want it to fit in so sort One of last needing thing. to reinvent the paradigm yeah I, th I think we're in it we're in a stage right now that we need to um to stop thinking of things in silos um and and you're seeing these blended ideologies mix in you know somebody had a little bit of isis and then somewhere some a little bit of incel and it doesn't really make any sense from an outside perspective but that's really where the threat is going to of course, you still have these Al Qaeda ISIS uh, adherents, and we can't. Uh, clearly, one of the, the larger threats in the U.S., especially because of operational planning and skill set, and a history of of committing mass violence. Uh, but you're also going to see these kind of one-off domestic extremist groups. Very interesting. And before I cut you off, you were going to tell us about your uh, social media handles. Sure. Uh, at the program of extremism, our social media handle is GWUPOE. And mine is um, Seamus Hughes, S-E-A-M-U-S, Hughes, H-U-G-H-E-S. Excellent. So we're going to pass that along to everybody. Uh, make sure they give you a follow. Make sure that if they go and get your book, Homegrown, uh, ISIS in America, it's a very, very compelling book. This has been a very interesting and enlightening conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. Uh, for anyone that joined us late, this has been Deputy Director of the Program on Extremism at George Washington University, Seamus Hughes. Thank you so much for taking the time and joining us, and hopefully we'll have you on again sooner than later. Of course. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. You too.